Uh, thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Happy Friday. President Barack Obama tried very hard to close the U.S. military prison at Guantanamo uh, in Cuba throughout his, his two terms as president. It was a campaign promise that he tried to keep, that he intended to keep, that I think he thought he would keep. But in the end, Congress really was able to thwart those efforts by the president and his administration, and Guantanamo was still open for business by the time Obama left office. To people who served in the Obama administration, and particularly people who worked on that issue in the Obama administration, I think that was a real disappointment from President Obama's two terms, that they weren't able to get Guantanamo closed, even though they really wanted to. But that said, they also didn't send a single new prisoner there for the entire eight years that Obama was president. For eight years, nobody was added to the prisoner population at Guantanamo. Well, now that Donald Trump is president, this week we did add our first new name in eight years to the prisoner roster at Guantanamo. Uh, the new guy at Guantanamo, as of Wednesday this week, is... Brigadier General John Baker of the United States Marine Corps. He is the second highest ranking lawyer in the United States Marine Corps. He's the chief defense counsel in the military commissions that are held at Guantanamo. And as we reported here for the first time on Wednesday night, a judge at Guantanamo, who incidentally, I should tell you, is just a colonel, he locked up this general at Guantanamo on Wednesday to start a period of confinement that was due to last 21 days. Uh, the general ended up serving two and a half days of that sentence at Guantanamo, but today we can report that uh, he's out. The second highest ranking lawyer in the United States Marine Corps has been freed from custody at Guantanamo. In fact, this is a snapshot that Miami Herald reporter Carol Rosenberg took of the general who does not seem all that happy about Carol Rosenberg taking this picture today, but this is documentary proof of him after he was released from custody and uh, whereupon he immediately headed back to his office at Guantanamo where he works on the defense side in the pseudo court system that's set up down there. Now, the reason the general was freed from custody today is because of a ruling from this, the Pentagon, it's sort of a Pentagon overseer of the military commissions at Guantanamo. Honestly, my read of this, it seems like the Pentagon might have intervened and freed the Marine general who they had locked up. I think they might have done that today, largely to prevent a civilian judge in a normal court in the United States from ordering him to be freed either today or over the weekend. I think they wanted to head off that possibility. Um, but even though, as of tonight, they're no longer locking up a brigadier general from the Marine Corps, that pseudo court system that they're running down at Guantanamo, it really is completely imploding. This morning, three civilian defense lawyers who are, who are defending a guy who's accused of the USS Cole bombing from back in 2000, the judge ordered those civilian lawyers to appear by video link to represent their client, even though these three defense lawyers have quit in protest. They say they can't ethically represent him. The judge ordered them all to appear anyway. Today, they didn't appear. So what? So what's going to happen now? Is the judge going to have these civilian lawyers arrested? The U.S. military is going to issue an order in Cuba that three American civilians in the United States should be arrested and then flown to a foreign country where they will be forced to provide legal services against their will and against their professional ethics for a defendant they say they no longer represent or speak to? Really? I mean, maybe the judge will try to force the lawyers to do that by video link from the war court headquarters in Virginia, even though the lawyers live all over the United States. Maybe they'll force them to go to Cuba. It's insane. So this, this Brigadier General in the Marine Corps has now been freed against the wishes of the judge at Guantanamo. The lawyers are still on the loose in the United States, and they're refusing to go to Guantanamo either in person or by video link, but the judge is trying to force the proceedings to go ahead anyway, and we don't know what he's gonna do. We don't know what he's gonna do to those lawyers. We don't know what's ultimately gonna happen to the, the Marine Corps general who's just been freed against the judge's will. We're all sort of waiting until Monday morning to figure out how that made up court system at Guantanamo is going to continue to explode because it's gonna continue to explode. It's not gonna fix itself. It just appears to have come to the end of the legal life support system it has been limping along on for so long. 
And that story about stuff going wrong at Guantanamo is fascinating in its own right, right? I mean, military commissions at Guantanamo over their 16-year lifespan, they've convicted a total of eight people, and four of those convictions have been overturned. And now the system itself is dissolving, and the only people it now appears, appears to be able to convict and lock up are defense lawyers and American generals. It's just, it's getting really weird. And that is a, a story that is worth telling and worth knowing about in its own right. But that story got an extra special spotlight put on it this week, in particular because the day after the terrorist attack in New York City this week, in which eight people were killed by a man pledging allegiance to ISIS, the day after that attack on Tuesday, the president told reporters that, in his view, the normal judicial system in the United States is a joke and a laughingstock and he says that he would prefer to send the suspect from that terrorist attack to Guantanamo. That was the same day the justice system at Guantanamo locked up a brigadier general in the Marine Corps. Sure, it seems like that system's working just as designed. I'm not sure if the president saw any coverage of that problem or he somehow got wind of the fact that things were actually falling apart at Guantanamo. But the next day, after he said he wanted to send that suspect to Guantanamo, the next day he apparently changed his mind and said, no, now he thinks the New York City terrorism attack suspect uh, should not go to Guantanamo. He should, caps lock, get the death penalty. Okay. I don't know if nobody's explained this to the president or if the president knows this and he doesn't care. But whether or not you think the New York City terrorist attack suspect should get the death penalty if he's convicted, whether or not you think he should get the death penalty, the only way you could assure that that suspect cannot get the death penalty is for the president to make a public case that he should. I mean, there's a reason presidents don't comment on ongoing criminal matters. It's because their remarks as president and commander-in-chief about somebody who's being tried in any American court, those remarks from the president are viewed as prejudicing the likely outcome of the trial, either in terms of that suspect's guilt or in terms of the appropriate sentence. And so there are really only two ways that a president can directly and dramatically affect the administration of justice in this country. Number one, the president can pardon people. Number two, the president can go down a list of criminal defendants and say, mm, guilty, 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 guilty. I think that person's guilty. I think that person's guilty. I think that person is super guilty and they definitely ought to do the maximum sentence. I mean, that's the other thing a president can do. Because when a president does that, when a president makes public pronouncements like that, he gravely interferes with the ability of the justice system to ever legitimately find that person guilty or sentence them without prejudice. And that's true either in the normal criminal justice system or in the military justice system or even in the half-baked military commission system that's blowing up right now at Guantanamo. The president has just to say about somebody who's on trial, I think this trial ought to end up that way. And the whole, and then you have ensured that the trial will not end up that way. The president's remarks about a person's uh, guilt or innocence and the sentence they should receive, those remarks have legal bearing. And so now, because of the president's tweet, whether or not you think it's a good thing or not, because of the president's tweet, the terrorist attack suspect from New York City this week will not ever get the death penalty in this country because of what President Trump said this week publicly about his case. And maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. But was it intentional? Even if nobody explained that consequence to him, even if nobody explained to him, hey, you're saving this guy's life by tweeting this. There's still a reason the president could reasonably been, have been expected to be mindful of that possibility when he made those remarks about the terrorism suspect this week. There's a reason you think he might have had it in mind, that there might be a consequence of him saying something like this about that case. And the reason he might have had that on his mind this week is because of Bo Bergdahl, right? Bo Bergdahl walked off base in Afghanistan in 2009. He was picked up within hours by the Taliban, held by them mostly in cages for five years. He was freed in 2014. The army charged him with desertion and misbehavior before the enemy which is a strange sounding phrase, but it's a very serious charge, comes with a possible life sentence. Bo Bergdahl pled guilty. He didn't fight the charges. But when it came to sentencing him, it was 
President Trump, who did all he could as president to make sure that Bo Bergdahl would get as light a sentence as possible. Right? It was a standard feature of Trump's stump speech during the campaign to denounce Bo Bergdahl as a traitor. He would even like act out the physical act of executing him. To call for Bergdahl to, to not just be executed, but to be executed in specific ways. He'd say to the crowd, you know, Bergdahl ought to be thrown out of an airplane without a parachute. He'd mime shooting him in the head. The president said all that stuff during the campaign about Bergdahl, and that arguably itself might have had a prejudicial outcome on Bergdahl's legal proceedings, Trump speaking as a presidential candidate. But then once Trump was president, and he was asked about Bo Bergdahl, he couldn't resist. He told reporters that he wanted to remind them of what he'd said about Bergdahl during the campaign. And bingo, just like that, the president personally ensured that some measure of lenience would be shown to Bo Bergdahl during his sentencing, specifically because of President Trump and his inability to not talk about this case. And in fact, the judge in the Bo Bergdahl case gave notice earlier this week that the president's inability to stop himself from continuing to talk about Bo Bergdahl, that would be seen as prejudicial to Bergdahl's ability to be treated appropriately and fairly within the justice system. It would be seen as, quote, mitigating evidence in deciding Bergdahl's sentence. And Bo Bergdahl was sentenced today. He was sentenced to a loss in rank, a fine, dishonorable discharge, but no prison time. Prosecutors had asked for 14 years, he got no prison time. And upon that sentence being handed down today in consideration of the mitigating evidence of the president trying to weigh in on how Bergdahl should be treated, once that sentence got handed down today, the president did it again. He put out a public response as president, as commander in chief to the Bergdahl sentencing, calling it a complete and total disgrace to our country and our military. And I hope that felt great to the president to get that off his chest. But you know what? The practical effect of him getting that off his chest is that Bergdahl's lawyers will now use that in their appeal. And their appeal is going forward. And because everybody in the military has to answer to the commander in chief, and the commander in chief has now expressed his personal displeasure with the lenience of the initial sentence in this case, that means in practical terms that further legal proceedings against Bo Bergdahl will also have to mitigate against the impact of the president's comments today. They will have to adjust the way they treat Bergdahl in court to account for the fact that the military justice system will now be inherently biased against him because of those words expressed on Twitter today by the commander in chief. Oops. The president is not the top law enforcement official in the country. The president is the head of the executive branch. The administration of justice, both in military and civilian courts, it's supposed to be conducted at a remove from all political concerns and certainly at a remove from the personal interests of anybody in government, including the president himself. And there really are only a couple exceptions to that. Uh, one exception is a thing that presidents do on purpose. One exception is the thing that presidents do when they're drunk or when they screw up or when their faculties momentarily desert them. I mean, the one they do on purpose is they use the power of the pardon, right? They can commute sentences. They can pardon people uh, for federal convictions. That's the one they do on purpose. The one that presidents can do when they screw up is by guaranteeing that the justice system will lean in the opposite direction of a preference expressed by the president during an ongoing criminal proceeding so as to compensate for the president's undue influence over that matter of justice, right? You can do it on purpose or you can, oops, so far, the president has pardoned one person, Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Arizona. And in terms of oops, he's blundered into at least a handful of other criminal cases, including two just this week. And I, th I think it's worth being clear how the president has exerted himself when it comes to the administration of justice, either on purpose or by accident. Because the president now appears to have started a fourth round a fourth round of strange, and I think not quite what it seems, um, open conflict with the guy who really is the top law enforcement official in the country, the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, in the last couple of days, once on a conservative talk radio show and today to reporters at the White House, the President openly lamented the behavior of Attorney General Jeff Sessions. He lamented that he doesn't have, that he, the President, doesn't have more personal control over what the Justice Department does. The president has spent the last few days tweeting furiously 
that the Justice Department and the FBI and Attorney General Jeff Sessions, they should be investigating and locking up Hillary Clinton and, and, and Democrats. And that has led to a happy feedback loop in the conservative media where the president says, why isn't Jeff Sessions jailing Hillary Clinton? And the conservative media says, yeah, why isn't Jeff Sessions locking up Hillary Clinton? And then the president says, everybody's wondering why Jeff Sessions isn't locking up Hillary Clinton. And these expressions of disgust and disappointment by the president toward his attorney general, it's being covered now as another like personality fight or another episode of palace intrigue in the administration with the president and his attorney general not getting along. There seems to be a real conflict between them. I wonder how this will work out. Let me just put this out there. We have no idea what's really going on between Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions. And we have no way of really knowing. Jeff Sessions was Trump's earliest supporter in the Senate. He gave him his entire Senate staff as the core of the White House policy staff. They campaigned together for months. Sessions ran a large part of the Trump campaign. Sessions, for his part, has never been known to say a crossword about the president, ever. And maybe there's some heartfelt personal conflict between them as men. I don't know. I don't care. Um, but I do know that this is the fourth round of this president shoveling public criticism onto this attorney general for a specific reason and creating an expectation among his base where Jeff Sessions is as popular as he is, creating an expectation among his base that maybe Jeff Sessions isn't so great after all, that maybe Jeff Sessions has to go. And there, there have been three instances of this before now, we're having the fourth one now. The first one was in March when Jeff Sessions was found to have had contacts with Russians during the campaign contacts he didn't disclose, even under oath at his confirmation hearing. When those contacts were exposed, Sessions responded to that news by recusing himself from overseeing the Russia investigation. Now, that was the very beginning of March. The president reacted to that. The president reacted to Jeff Sessions recusing himself from the Russia issue by going, quote, ballistic. The president erupted with anger. The president feels Sessions' recusal was unnecessary. So that was the first time Trump flashes anger over Sessions' recusal. That was one. Second time was two months later in May. We learned about that one from the New York Times. Quote, shortly after learning in May that a special counsel had been appointed to investigate links between his campaign associates and Russia, President Trump berated Attorney General Jeff Sessions in an Oval Office meeting and said he should resign. The president attributed the appointment of the special counsel to Sessions' decision to recuse himself from the Justice Department's Russia investigation. Quote, ashen and emotional, Sessions told the president he would quit and he sent a resignation letter to the White House. Quote, Trump ended up rejecting Sessions' resignation letter after senior members of his administration argued that dismissing him would only create more problems for the president. So the first time the president blew up at Jeff Sessions and let it be known publicly and it resulted in headlines about how furious he was at Jeff Sessions was when Sessions recused himself on the Russia thing in March. And two months later, the president again goes absolutely ballistic at Jeff Sessions, gets a resignation letter from Sessions. What's the source of the president's anger? Again, Jeff Sessions being recused from the Russia investigation. Then the third time is in July. Now, mid-July was a very tough time for the White House on this story, right? The Trump Tower meeting involving his son and his son-in-law and Paul Manafort and all those Russians gets exposed by the New York Times. The president himself reportedly drafts the initial false statement explaining that away, which immediately gets public disproven by his son's own emails. His son then has to hire a criminal defense attorney. The White House itself has to hire new Russia lawyers. His son gets threatened with a subpoena. All right, while all that is blowing up and very close to home, the president in July opens up another salvo at his attorney general, Jeff Sessions. And what's he so mad at Jeff Sessions about? Guess. Sessions gets the job. Right after he gets the job, he recuses himself. Was that a mistake? Well, Sessions should have never recused himself. And if he would, if he was going to recuse himself, he should have told me before he took the job, and I would have picked somebody else. Why is it so important that Sessions recuse himself? What would you expect him to be doing now in the Justice Department if he were overseeing the Russia investigation? But that was the third big blow up between this president and his attorney general. 
right, starting yet another round of intensive media coverage of whether or not the attorney general and the president were really fighting, whether they disliked each other, whether he was going to have to go, this terrible rift between the president and the attorney general. How personal is it? Is it emotional? Right. That, was, that was the third time. The first one is when he recuses. Second one is when Mueller is appointed. Why did you recuse yourself? That's why Mueller was appointed. Third one is when the Trump Tower meeting comes out. Why isn't he recused? Why did he recuse? And now we're having the fourth one. And this one came on indictment week. A lot of people are disappointed in the Justice Department, including me. So this is now the fourth round of more or less open conflict between this president and his attorney general. Not so much conflict as it is the president shoveling stuff onto the attorney general. And all four times that it's happened, it appears to be keyed to the Russia investigation and the president's anger is focused, or his, at least the focus of his criticism, is on Jeff Sessions recusing himself. Why isn't he running the Russia investigation? If you are concerned, about the Russia thing, about the Trump campaign, its contacts with Russia during the election while Russia was influencing the election to help him, right? If you're concerned about that, Jeff Sessions is probably one of the people from the campaign you are concerned about, right? This plea agreement for the Trump foreign policy advisor, George Papadopoulos, that was unsealed this week, in that plea agreement, we now have yet more instances of the attorney general apparently suffering very convenient memory lapses when it comes to uh, him forgetting about contacts between the Trump campaign and Russia that he was definitely in on. I mean, obviously he knew about his own meetings with Russian officials during the campaign, but he forgot about them under oath. He knew about this advisor trying to set up meetings between the Trump campaign and Russian officials, but he forgot about them under oath. It now appears that he knew about a Trump campaign advisor taking a trip to Moscow in the middle of the campaign to go meet with Russian officials, but he forgot about that too under oath. I mean, if you're concerned about the Russia contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russian government, and in particular the efforts to keep those contacts secret, then Jeff Sessions really is at the heart of what you're probably concerned about. That said, do you think Trump should fire him? Because the reason Trump wants to fire him is because Sessions is recused from overseeing the Russia investigation. If Trump fires him, he will replace Sessions with somebody who is not recused from overseeing the Russia investigation. Someone who would be more to Trump's liking on that point specifically. Because that's the point that Trump keeps hitting with Sessions. It's that. What all these other things that it might, it's not. Four times is not a coincidence. Four times he goes after him on the recusal. It's the recusal. If he gets rid of Sessions, he's going to put in somebody who will not be recused, and that will be the reason he gets rid of Rush. That's will be the reason he gets rid of Sessions. So should he get rid of him? I mean, if you think the Russia attack and the possibility that the Trump campaign was in on it is a serious national security matter for this country, a serious political crisis for this country, what's worse? Having an attorney general of the United States, a serving attorney general who is, is up to his neck in that scandal. What's worse, that or not having that attorney general who's up to his neck in that scandal? I mean, if you're Congress and you want to go after the bad actors in this scandal, should you go after Jeff Sessions? Or is Jeff Sessions the one person you absolutely should not go after under any circumstances, no matter what he did, because he needs to stay in that job? You tell me. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.